The Lord be with you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Our worship service this morning is Divine Service Setting 4 on page 203. We stand to sing our opening hymn, 794. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. (coughs) Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We pray the intro responsively. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. Save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. 
To you, O Lord, I call. My rock, be not deaf to me, lest if you be silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts, and I am helped. My heart exalts, and with my song, I give thanks to him. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord of all power and might, author and giver of all good things, graft into our hearts the love of your name. Increase in us true religion. Nourish us with all goodness. And of your great mercy, keep us in the same. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the sixth Sunday after Trinity is from Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. 
Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord, is, the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, Be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, 
lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison? Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, May be seated. We welcome you this morning to Zion Evangelical Lutheran Church. Uh, we are once again asking you not to fill out the fellowship pads or the communion cards as we are doing our best to take uh, attendance uh, through other ways. Uh, a couple of announcements. Number one, we have a voters meeting next Sunday between services at 930 in the fellowship hall uh, downstairs. Stay tuned to uh, more announcements this coming week on the email chain as we try to figure out how to do our voters meeting in the safest way possible. Uh, and the last announcement, uh, once again, uh, I know some of you have heard this spiel several times, but it's always worth repeating. So the service of the sacrament we're going to be doing, we're still doing slightly differently. I'll consecrate the elements at the altar and bring communion to you in the pews. If you want to receive communion, please stay standing. If you don't want to receive communion, please be seated. Uh, I will come through with the host. Um, an elder will come through with the individual cups. The vicar will come through with the chalice, and then we'll have an usher come right behind uh, with the basket to collect the individual cups. After you've received the sacrament in both kinds, please be seated. And after we get done singing whatever hymn we are singing during the distribution, there will be one blessing for everybody at the end. And uh, last thing, we are still once again collecting the offering after the church service. And I see that plate's going. Is there an offering plate back there, Dave? Okay. Uh, so we'll collect the offering after the worship service is over. Uh, that's it for announcements. We will continue with our office hymn, hymn 562. Amen, sin in fact. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hear these words again from the Gospel reading, Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So far, the word of the Lord. When I was in seminary, we had a priest from the Anglican Church of North America, ACNA, the Missouri Synod equivalent in the Anglican Church, come talk to us about the doctrine and life of their church body. Well, after his talk, I asked him what his opinion was of the Missouri Synod, and I'll never forget his answer. He said, I think the Missouri Synod ties their shoes too tight. Remember that analogy, shoes too tight, because we'll come back to it. In our Gospel reading, Jesus' teaching begins, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. The word translated abolish here is used by Jesus' opponents during his trial and crucifixion. They mockingly say as they wag their heads in Mark 15, 29, for example, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Jesus did not come to abolish or destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And the way Jesus fulfilled it was by being perfectly obedient to it. This included submitting to a death on the cross, which destroyed the temple that was his body, as it were. For the temple is where God dwells, and God dwelled in the person, the body of Jesus. Jesus says in John 2.19, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Jesus allows himself to be destroyed, as it were, that God's word may be fulfilled. Not one iota, which is the smallest Greek letter, or one dot, which is a word that more than likely refers to the smallest Hebrew letter. By the way, that smallest Hebrew letter is a little hook. And that word dot, if you remember the old King James, I think it used to be tittle, if I'm not mistaken. Little hook, little, little jab, smallest letter. So not the smallest Greek letter, not the smallest Hebrew letter. Summarized in the Old Testament, the New Testament scriptures will pass from the law until all, everything, is accomplished. Jesus then makes a concluding statement in verse 19, which also serves as a sermon text today. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teachers, said it again, and teaches others to do the same, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now follow me here. The word translated as relaxes is the same word that Jesus uses for destroy when he says in John 2.19, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The sermon title today is God's Word Takes No Vacation because God's Word does not relax. God's Word takes no days off. Now that title came to me, whatever you want to say, a couple weeks before my family's vacation a few weeks ago. And the reason was is because humans do need rest. God instituted a weekly day of rest in creation. Remember what Jesus says in Mark 2.27, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So God's Word is neither destroyed nor relaxed. It does not vacation. It takes and needs no Sabbath. The Greek word I keep talking about is luce or lucita, from which we get the English word loose or loosen. So go back to the beginning of this sermon, the analogy I told you to remember. The Anglican priest suggested that the Missouri Synod ties its shoes too tight. Do we? Should we? I think we do, and I think we should. Why? Because we don't loose 
or loosen God's word, law or gospel. We can't relax it. We can't destroy it. Whoever relaxes or looses one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. These are Jesus' words. We don't want to be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Now someone might say, well, even if you're least, you're still there. That would be missing the point. The one who eases loosens, relaxes, or destroys, whatever verb you want to put in there, God's commandments in their doctrine or in their practice might still believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, but false doctrine is always a slippery slope that may lead to faithlessness. No faith, no heaven, great or least. So we keep our laces tight, as it were, precisely because God's word always matters. Even when we take vacations or have days off, God's word still guides our holidays and informs us how to live them. We have Sabbaths from our work. There is no Sabbath from the Christian life. Jesus continues, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The scribes and Pharisees were the most righteous people in the land. They kept God's commandments and were the, committed to be the most pious, doing the most pious external works. So what Jesus does here in our next verse is he applies the spirit of the law, lest we think keeping the commandments externally can fulfill them. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. You see, it's possible, it's possible for us to keep the external works of the law. What I mean is, we could be in church every single Sunday. We might not kill anybody. We might not have sex outside of marriage. We might not steal anything, to name a few examples. But Jesus teaches us that God's commandments are not for external use only. If one even has anger in his heart towards his brother or sister in Christ, he's breaking the fifth commandment. For parents teaching their children God's word at home, Today's gospel reading is how you apply it to their life. Malicious name calling from the mouth of a two or three year old equally, equally breaks the you shall not murder prohibition alongside the most notorious serial killer. If we actually believe the scriptures, Parents and teachers would not tolerate name-calling any more than we would tolerate a bomb or a death threat. Being liable to the hell of fire, Jesus' words, is far worse than the threat of losing our earthly life. For hell is eternal. And that's the significance of the last half of today's Gospel reading. Jesus says, So if you're offering your gift at the altar... And there remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother. If you're holding a grudge against someone or they have something rightfully against you, be reconciled to each other. You will be accountable to pay every last penny of the prison sentence, as it were, as Jesus concludes our reading today. The Christian life is one of repentance and faith. Jesus will teach in the verses following our gospel reading today that if a man even looks at a woman with lust in his heart, he has committed adultery. The spirit of the law is to be kept not only in deed, but also in words 
and thoughts. Yet even with all the human effort to keep God's word in thought, word, and deed, and not relaxing, loosening, or destroying any of God's laws, there is no way that we can satisfy the law's demands, let alone surpass the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. But we know that there is someone who did, and that, of course, was and is Jesus. His righteousness is perfect. Jesus is holy without sin. So Jesus isn't lying in our text today. There's no way that we can enter the kingdom of heaven unless our righteousness abounds beyond that of the scribes and Pharisees. So if Jesus is the only person whose righteousness did and ever can do that, what benefit is that to us? The glory of the gospel is that the assurance of our entrance into the kingdom of heaven is not based on our merit, but on Christ's merit. By faith, his righteousness, which exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, by faith becomes our righteousness. Jesus takes away our sin, puts it on himself. He, in exchange, gives us his righteousness. When Christians say that we are saved by grace through faith, we are confessing salvation is God's gift through or by faith simply means that we trust God's declarations and God's promises to be true for us. We confess that God gave his only begotten son to die for us and through his innocent suffering and death, his perfect righteousness paid every last penny of our sin. Because we are saved by grace through faith, we now seek to honor God's name, not only with our lips, but also with our hearts. Just as parents teach their kids to tie their shoes tightly so they don't trip over their loose laces or stumble because of flimsy ankle support, we as the church must believe, teach, and confess that God's word be taught and kept tightly until the last day when the fullness of all things are accomplished. For then we will understand most clearly what the difference between the least and the greatest in the kingdom of heaven means, and we will rejoice in the order God has created. We'll sing our praises and thanksgiving that God's word never took a day off, but continued to lead us all to repentance and faith throughout our earthly sojourn, bringing us shame when we transgressed it and bringing us comfort when we repent. As we prayed in the intro with, the Lord is my strength and my shield. The Lord is the strength of his people. In him my heart trusts and I am helped. You know what it's like walking along a road, maybe going to hike through the woods with untied shoelaces. You're tripping and stumbling all over the place. There's a security when you've got tight laces and tight ankle support. Such is the word of the Lord. That's why the intro, it can, can the psalmist can say in the intro, it, the Lord is the strength of his people. The Lord is the, my strength and my shield. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> And now the peace of God which transcends all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds faithful in Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue by singing hymn 956.
we continue with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. <laughs>
Now this body and this blood strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in the peace of Christ. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen. Christ the eternal. 